Welcome to everyone here and viewers watching us at home, to the League of Women Voters of Larchmont Mamaroneck special evening with author and ECHO entrepreneur Diane McAkern. I'm Elizabeth Radow, president of the League. To those of us who know climate change is not a political issue, but a real issue requiring real solutions, it helps to have someone with answers to turn to. While Congress debates issues other than environment, and our DEC, that is Department of Environmental Conservation, lacks the staff to fully enforce the environmental laws we do have, it becomes increasingly important for citizens to take responsibility. The good news is, we can. Women spend 85 cents of every retail dollar. Educated purchasing decisions can make a difference in the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the longevity of our forests, among other things. Everything from the cars we drive to the household appliances and furniture we select to the food we eat and the products we use to clean our homes has an impact. Tonight we are in for a rare treat with Diane McAkern, author of the bestseller Big Green Purse, the book that tells us how to harness our spending power to create a cleaner, cleaner, greener, and I will also add healthier planet. Diane has advised the Environmental Protection Agency, the World Bank, World Wildlife Fund, and numerous other agencies and not-for-profit organizations focusing on protecting the planet. Diane generously worked with me this summer to help our League chapter organize our supermarket sweep, uh, where League members and others in the area met with supermarket representatives to learn more about how stores stock their shelves, how to purchase economically, and how to ask for the products that we as consumers would like to buy. Our supermarket sweep launched a relationship of working together with our supermarkets, which has resulted in a soon-to-be-installed bike rack at Stop and Shop, and an open dialogue to work with retailers to expand our environmentally friendly purchasing options. Anyone can approach our local retailers with product requests. They are here to serve our needs. We were pleasantly surprised by how receptive they were. Looking out in the audience, I see Debbie Tedesco, who brilliantly led us at Stop and Shop, and I'm really grateful that you're here tonight. Thanks, Debbie. Uh, during tonight's presentation, Diane is going to give us tips on how to afford green products during these challenging economic times. Diane will tell us how each of us can make a difference to the quality of our lives and the planet by harnessing the purchasing of our dollar. Diane will also share her lists of do's and don'ts, and after her presentation, Diane will answer your questions about living a greener life. After Diane speaks, those of us in the studio will be able to participate in a free raffle of eco-friendly gifts. You can have the opportunity to buy Diane's books and enjoy some of the great holiday treats brought to you from the bakers on the League of Women Voters Board of Directors. Please join me with a rousing welcome for Diane McAkern. Thank you, Elizabeth, for that wonderful introduction. And everybody who has come out tonight you know I got off the train and it was snowing and I thought I hope this is a hearty crowd because <laughs> it's nippy out there but everyone is here and to the people in the viewing audience thanks so much for tuning in um, you know I know we want to sort of get to the do's and don'ts but before we do that I really wanted to talk about money and how much money we all have. And I don't mean that facetiously. Uh, you know, I've got a husband, two kids. I have to remember to mention the kids before the dog. Uh, a dog, two cats, a house. I run a business. I contribute to charities. I'm active in my community. So probably like everybody in the room and everybody watching, you know, I feel the pinch especially right now, the economy's tough, and it's the holidays, and the kids are sending the list. You know, it was nice when they sent it to Santa, now they're sending it to me directly. So I know what it's like to manage a budget, and we're all sort of strapped right now. On the other hand, if I don't think just about myself, but I think about all of us, 
suddenly the amount of economic clout that we have is actually really huge. You know, me, you, my sisters, your kids' teachers, the cashier at the 7-Eleven. If you think about all of us together and all this purchasing power we have, it's enormous. And Beth already mentioned, you know, in the marketplace, what it really means is that we're spending 85 cents of every dollar, women. And with all due respect to the guys in the audience, and I always say this, you know, if you're spending money, you're not exempt from this idea that your money makes a difference. But we have a tendency, I think, to think that there's not too much we can do because, you know, we're just so busy doing all these other things, running our households and working and keeping the kids dressed and entertained and all that. What can we really do? And yet, is there a day that goes by that we don't actually buy something? I mean, I long for those days when I don't have to run to the store and get the milk or, you know, my kid needs something for school again. So the, the amount of money that we're spending is really huge. And I like to say, you know, we're not just buying cheese doodles and diapers, right? If you look at what's happening in the marketplace, women are buying 14% more electronics than men are. We're buying as many cars. Now, you may not be treated that way when you go to the car lot. Women are buying as many cars as men. Who do you think is buying more clothes? That's a no-brainer, right? Food, cosmetics, cleaning products. Women are spending more money at Home Depot than men. And my husband said, <clears throat> no. I go to Home Depot. And I said, what do you do when you get there? And what does he do when he gets there, ladies? He calls me. <laughs> Are you sure this is what you watch? I was thinking about getting this. No. No, because that doesn't work with the house, right? So the amount of purchasing power that we have is huge. In the recent census, the recent United States census, the median income in a household is $50,000. So just think of what, there are 25, maybe 25 people in the room today. So if we're all just managing only $50,000 in a year, what do you think of dump incomes and money coming in, money coming out? Look around you right now. In this room right now is almost $1.3 million worth of purchasing power. $1.3 million. So what? Just think about the power of a million dollars. So when you think about how much power do you have, take out the wallet and take a look at all that money. As little as it is, every single dime makes a difference. Every single dime makes a difference. And where is it really making a difference? It makes a difference in two ways. I think that the way we spend our money is our first line of defense. There are tens of thousands of chemicals that are circulating in the environment, and we're never going to be able to regulate most of them. There are 80,000 chemicals that have been synthesized and put into the environment. The EPA has banned exactly four. And in this regulatory climate, no pun intended, with what's going on on Capitol Hill and the most extreme partisanship that's ever existed. How many more things do you think we're going to be able to control? How easy do you think it's going to be to control just one more nasty little thing that's out there? It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. We couldn't get a climate bill in this Congress with a very supportive president who controlled, controlled the House and the Senate. And things have totally changed. And it's not, we're not, we cannot rely on legislation to protect us. As much as we need legislation, as much as we need regulation, what do we have control over? We have control over what we buy, what we bring into our houses, what we put on our bodies. So number one, the, I think the number one reason why you change the way you spend your money is to protect yourself. But you know what else? When you spend your money you are sending a direct communication to the manufacturer of the product that you bought, right? Why? Why is that? Because consumer 
dollars are their lifeblood. If you're not buying their stuff, they're not in business. So it's in their interest to get you to buy what they make, right? But it's in your interest to get them to make what you want to buy. And you can do that based on how you spend your money. Nobody else can do that except you. And in fact, we've seen this incredible groundswell of support for exactly this, for people using the big green purse, that idea that your money makes a difference in product after product after product after product. You've heard about BPA, bisphenol A. You know, it's this nasty stuff that's in baby bottles and rubber duckies and the lining of soda cans and all this stuff. The chances of getting that regulated so that it's not in that product, in our products, it's, I just, it's not on the radar. It's not even on the radar right now with everything else that's going on, at least federally. But yet, what's happening in the marketplace? How many of you see, would see a, a bottle that says, and this contains BPA, and you'd buy it? You wouldn't do it, right? When you buy anything with plastic now, what do you look for? BPA-free. Three years ago, you know the Nalgene company? So Nalgene water bottles and all that. Three years ago, every bottle that they sold had BPA in it. Every bottle. Only three years ago. And after this incredible groundswell of consumer concern and consumers buying the alternative, now if you go to the Nalgene website, nothing has BPA in it. And that didn't happen because the law said you have to get rid of it. It happened because you said it, right? Because you said, I'm not, I'm not going to buy that for my kids or my grandkids or myself. So we're already seeing incredible support in the marketplace. How many people remember buying, or you know, when organic fruit first was really available, if it wasn't, you weren't growing it yourself, and you wanted to buy an organic apple or organic milk. You had to go to a natural food store, right? You had to go to a sort of a marginal store because nobody was really selling it. It wasn't, it wasn't common. But as consumers became more educated about the value of organic food and other manufacturers like and retailers like Whole Foods started rising up to meet demand, what happened? The traditional retailers and producers said, you know, we've got to do, we're going to lose that money if we don't make, start making organic too. So now there's almost no, certainly there's no major retailer, I would say, in the United States where you can go and you can't find organic milk. You can't find it. And why is that? Because you, all of you, intentionally or not, said we want organic. And that is happening in product after product after product. Nail polish. Nail polish. Nail polish has, in my book, I go through, I have a litany of the chemicals in nail polish. I mean, they're really nasty things. And toluene and, and phthalates, phthalates are banned in the state of California because they're a reproductive toxin. And they're in nail polish. Why? Because they make nail polish flexible. That's why nail polish bends, because there are these nasty things in them called phthalates. What are the chances that we're going to get those banned nationwide? It's very tough. I mean, California is always ahead of the curve on stuff like that, so they were able to do it, but it's not going to happen. I grew up in the state of Michigan. It's definitely not going to happen there. They're trying to survive getting through the car problems, right? But, yeah, we don't have to buy that stuff because consumers started creating demand for for nail polish that did not have those chemicals in it. And funny, cute little companies, there's one called Honeybee. Uh, they started making nail polish that doesn't have those nasty chemicals in it. And who started paying attention? Um, the big nail, nail polish manufacturers like Sally Hansen. So a few, and I've got the story in my book. So a few years ago, finally Sally Hansen said, you know, we don't want to lose market share. They don't really care about the chemicals. They don't. They care about their bottom line. They care about their profits. And knowing that, you can say to them, we will not buy your product unless it's safe for us. So on a whole host of issues, we can do things like this. And, you know, getting to the list of do's and don'ts, one of the do's is 
shift your spending to the greenest products and services available. That's, you know, that's every, every single one of us can do it. We don't have to do it for everything, but we can do it on the things that are most important to us, to each one of us. And you can feel great about knowing that you're really doing the best for yourself, your family, and you're putting pressure on these, these manufacturers. So I've been in Washington for about 30 years. And you can, yes, you can all feel sorry for me because it's brutal. It's been brutal from the beginning, and it's still brutal. One of the interesting things that I've watched is what's happened with cars. In 1998, how many hybrid cars do you think were sold in the United States? Wild guess. None. Right. There were none. 1998. The end of 1999... Honda introduced its first hybrid, and in early 2000, Toyota put the Prius on the, in the market. And in fact, I have that car. I'm one of those early adapters. My kids call it the ugly Prius. They keep saying, Mom, can't you please get the cool Prius? But no, I've got the ugly Prius. But So anyway, in the meantime, the, um, Representatives from Toyota, I heard, I heard Leah Coca on National Public Radio talking about this. And, and these companies, manufacturers from Toyota came over and had a meeting with Leah Iacocca. And they said, you know, we're building these hybrids and we really want to disseminate them in the marketplace. And we want to get a better sense of your assembly line, how it works. And Iacocca said, what are you making? And they said, hybrids. And he said, well, that's stupid. We're building Hummers. No kidding. And he now admits this. He looks back on it and says, you know, what were we thinking? So anyway, 1998, no hybrids. 1999, a few. 2000, a few. By 2005, there were about 83,000 hybrids sold in the United States. Now, how many cars, how many cars total do you think were sold in the United States in 2005? Any, anybody have any idea? 17 million. So 83,000 hybrids out of 17 million total vehicles. And in 2005, that 83,000, that tiny little number, less than 1%, suddenly all the manufacturers are saying, oh my gosh, we're missing the hybrid market. Everybody started putting plans on the drawing board to make their own hybrid vehicles. And this year at the North American Auto Show in Detroit, which will happen in about a month, every manufacturer who's there will have some form of hybrid. General uh, um, Motors is going to have the Volt. Nissan is going to have the Leaf, the Leaf, another electric vehicle. In the meantime, okay, I'm in Washington. I'm bringing you news from Washington. What are, what are these companies doing on Capitol Hill when the discussion turns to raising fuel efficiency standards? What do you think they're doing? They're spending millions of dollars fighting any kind of legislation to raise fuel efficiency standards. They don't want the legislation. They don't want to be regulated. But yet, in the marketplace, they're saying, they're all talking about how fuel efficient they are. And they're all trying to outdo each other. There's a big story in, uh, on the front page of the business section of USA Today from General Motors saying, you know, we're going to be so fuel efficient and we're cutting our CO2. But honestly, on Capitol Hill, they're not lobbying that way. So the marketplace is what is really making a difference. And it's making a difference because you're asking for it. Now, the funny thing for somebody like me, and I've been, I will date myself right now, and I'll tell you, I was at the first Earth Day. So I've been in this for a really long time, and it has been tough. It has been really tough. So I love it when people come up to me and say, oh, don't you love this? The green is everywhere. I don't know where it came from. Just overnight, we've got green this, and we've got green that. I'm thinking, yeah, this is one of those overnights that has lasted for 40 years, you know? Um, so it seems like everything is pretty green, right? I mean, everywhere, everybody's trying to talk about how green they are. So how green is the world? So we've talked about your spending your money so that you can protect yourself. We've talked about it so that you encourage manufacturers and retailers to go green. What about the supply chain, just generally? How green is it? 
So let's talk about organic food. Has everybody bought something organic at some point, say in the last year? You've bought milk or fruit or something that's organically grown. What percent of food that's available to consumers generally do you think is organic? Well, just throw some numbers out there. 5%, 1%. It's about 3.5%. It's only 3.5%. So what did you, you know, we all have taken some kind of economics. We're a little bit, we a little bit, we understand a little bit supply and demand, right? There's only 3.5% in the supply chain right now. So demand is critical if we're going to create more supply because that's a law that's that's how the American economy runs on supply and demand. So unless we in fact use our money to protect ourselves to get manufacturers to do the right thing, create demand, it's not it's just not going to happen. I mean less than 1% of cars on the market still are highly fuel fuel efficient. What about clothes? Think about clothing, how little clothing is available that's made from organic materials or recycled materials or hemp or bamboo or any of these other tensile, more eco-friendly fabrics. It's minuscule. Clothing, when you wear clothes, you are wearing energy. You are wearing water. You are wearing plants. You are also wearing an enormous amount of pesticides because that is what is used to produce most cotton most fabric that we wear. And yet, only 14% of clothes are recycled. With all that stuff we're giving to the Salvation Army and you know, doing at yard sales and thrift shops and so on, only 14% of our clothes are recycled. So the opportunity is absolutely huge. And these are all things that we can do. Everything that I'm talking about, changing the way we spend our money, preferential shopping so that we're creating demand, talking to retailers so that they understand how important it is that we're going to spend our money sort of where our mouth is. Those are all things that we can do. And as important as it is to elect public officials who really understand the importance of protecting the environment, and it, it is, it's absolutely crucial, um, we can't sort of give it up and just say government's just going to solve this problem, or if, if they don't do it, then there's not too much we can do about it. We are the most powerful people in the world. The governor, Rick Perry, the governor of Texas, um, it, you know, Texas is one of the most progressive states for women in business, believe it or not. There are more women starting businesses in Texas, I think, than in almost any other state. So every year, there's a, a Texas conference for women, and I've spoken there a couple of times. And Rick Perry loves talking about the fact that women in America control $7 trillion. $7 trillion. We're this, I, I like to say we're the CEOs of our households, right? We decide we, we're often in charge of managing our budgets and figuring out what's going to go where. Why, we're the chief environmental officers of our households, too. Right? Because we can make these choices about how we use energy and what products we buy. But part of where that $7 trillion comes from is in the fact that women now make up 51% of the purchasing agents for all companies in America. That means that at work, we're buying, we're ordering the pens and the pencils and the fleet vehicles and the chairs and the desks and the paper. So not only do we have this incredible power at home, but we increasingly have it at work, too. So thinking about that power, it's one of the reasons why companies are courting women so intensely because we're spending so much money. And it's one of the things that is really the key message of Big Green Purse, which is that we have this incredible power to make a difference. So what, why don't we? Why don't we do more? What gets in the way? Life. <laughs> Life is very challenging. Um, I've actually done a lot of survey research on why more of us don't do more than we do. Uh, and there are five reasons, five interesting reasons. Um, but the top two are, and well, 
you know, why don't you tell me why, you know, what makes it hard for you to make choices, different choices? Availability, Availability convenience, cost, habits, right? And habits is one. We're just by the same thing over and over again, right? Knowledge, right? So confusion. So I, I sort of call these the five C's. You know, it's cost, convenience, confusion, concern about quality. You know, is it as good? And is it better? Because I'm not going to switch my brand if it's not better, right? How many times have you thought that? I'd love to do it, but I'm not going to switch if it's not really better. I want to talk about two of those obstacles. One is cost, and one is um, this concern about um, convenience and availability. On the cost front, uh, I really encourage people to start thinking about the new, I call it the new math, the green math. And at Big Green Purse, we're big fans of doing the green math. Green math is when you actually take a minute to look at what you're buying and, and look at the extended life of that purchase. So for example, a compact fluorescent light bulb costs about $3 compared to an incandescent light bulb, which costs about $0.69, cents, right? So when you're there and you have to make that choice, it is so tempting to buy to spend $0.69. Cents. Except that as soon as you turn in that bulb, what does it start doing? It starts using energy. It starts using energy because of the nature of an incandescent. It wastes, 90% of the energy that an incandescent bulb uses, it wastes because of the nature of the technology of an incandescent. When you use a compact fluorescent light bulb, which costs $3, what does it start doing right away? It starts saving you energy. Over the lifetime of the bulb, you save $60 compared to the incandescent because it lasts so long and it uses energy so efficiently. And the thing that I like is that I don't have to change the bulbs. They last a really long time. But we, don't, we often don't think about those kinds of calculations, right? Because we're so focused on what's happening right now. And I'll be in a store. I, I'm, a, I'm really fun to go shopping with, believe me, because I'm stopping and I'm talking to everybody. Say, what, what's, you know, I don't see any organic milk in there. Oh, you know. I've got some. How come you didn't buy it? Blah, blah, blah. So people will say to me, well, that a gallon of organic milk is $3, costs $3 more than a gallon of conventional milk, which it does. It does, and it always will. And so the person will say, it's $3 more, and I can't afford that. And what might they have in their cart? They might have $15 worth of bottled water. That's the green math. It's like if you actually looked at the whole shopping cart, Bottled water is such a waste of money for people living in most parts of the United States. Why? First of all, bottled water is usually tap water. It's not the special spring water that's also pure. Most of the time, bottled water is actually tap water. So what are you paying for? You're paying for the bottle. You're paying for the label. You're paying for the cap. You're paying for the box that all that water comes in. You're paying for the truck that delivered all that water. And you're paying for the two gallons of every, uh, two gallons of water that are wasted for every gallon that's bottled. You're paying for that. So it turns out that bottled water, sort of taste by taste, is about 10,000 times more expensive than tap water. Yet people will say, I'd love to buy organic milk, but I can't afford it. So I really want another do is to look at your budget and do the green math. Look at what you're buying. It's not that everything needs to switch, but there are some switches that you can make that are actually going to save you a whole lot of money. And we've got a bunch of items on the table here, and later in the raffle you're going to have the opportunity to win some. But cleaning products is one of the greatest opportunities to save money. I mean, you can clean your entire house with these four things. The, the Bon Ami cleanser, which is just a little pulverized rock, vinegar, a little lemon juice, and a little baking soda. I'm, I kid you not, your entire house. Yet, how long is the shopping aisle for cleaning products? Think about it. It is about maybe twice the length of this room on two sides, just cleaning products. 
And just about all those things have the same word on them. And what is that word? Hazard. Right? Because they contain dangerous chemicals. And they're not going to be regulated. The government only says, the government only says that the company needs to tell you it's dangerous. The government does not say, regulations do not say they cannot put those chemicals in there. They just need to tell you in that teeny, tiny, minute, impossible to read, little type hazard. And you don't need it. All you need is the stuff that's right here on this table. That's all you really need. So you can make a difference based on how you spend your money, the messages that you give to the retailer. Um, we have a couple of other things up here that I wanted to mention that you might not be aware of that you can make a where you can make a difference. One is coffee, shade grown coffee. Yeah, I love this label. Uh, and I don't know how many people know much about coffee, but coffee is a native plant, is a plant that's native to the tropics. And it grows in the shade of rainforest trees, native, naturally, that's where it goes, grows. But manufacturers realized that they could develop a breed of coffee that would grow in the sun, and they could grow a lot more coffee. Except that in the, in the tropics, it's all shade trees. So how do you think they could grow those coffee plants in the sun? What would they have to do? They have to cut down the forest. So when they cut down the forest, it's a chain reaction, right? What happens? Well, all those birds right now, we're all freezing. The birds are not freezing because you know where they are? They're in the rainforest. Except that they're losing their habitat because of all these sun, sunny, sun-loving coffee plantations. So one thing that you can do that really makes a difference is to buy shade-grown coffee. And I will say that Beth has produced a fabulous movie about shade-grown coffee, and maybe you'll give us the link after the presentation is over. So that's one thing that, where you can make a difference. One thing that's fun to do, my favorite, organic coffee, uh, chocolate. Chocolate is another one of these things. It comes from the cocoa, from the cacao tree that grows in the rainforest. And when you're buying organic cocoa, an organic chocolate, again, it's a, it, you don't think about it. It's this chain reaction. You're buying it here. It creates a market for farmers down in the tropics to do the right thing. So there are tremendous opportunities in just about everything that you buy. And if it's not available from your retailer where you shop, ask for it, right? That is the simplest thing that we can do. It's not something necessarily that retailers want to hear. They want a really smooth shopping experience, right? Now, um, just try going into a store and asking for organic, non-chlorine, bleached, feminine hygiene products. You get a very quick response on that one. There are a lot of things that you can ask for if you don't see them to at least start to plant the seed. And I hope Debbie from um, Stop and Shop, you know, she'll share some of, you know, the very positive experience that she's had with consumers from the League of Women Voters going in and starting a conversation about what we want to see that maybe isn't there anymore. And of course, if you don't see it in the store, you can always shop online. Now. I don't want to imply that we can solve all of our problems by shopping. That's not what I'm saying. I mean, we really do need strong local and national legislation. We need to enforce regulations. Um, but it's, it is something that we can do that has so much power, so much impact. We can all do it. We can do it individually. We can do it collectively. That if we don't do it, it seems to me that we're remiss, that we're, we're just missing a big opportunity to take all that power we have to change the world. And that's what we can do, person by person and all of us together. You know, the other thing that we can do, and it's a, it's a big do for me, is to talk about what we're doing. It turns out there's all this research about what the most powerful tools of communication are. 
you know, there's the internet and there's advertising, there's TV advertising, radio advertising, billboards. Word of mouth is the most powerful form of communication that exists. So don't keep it to yourselves. You know, if you found a great green product, if you found a solution to something that really works for you, make sure you share it. Because there is this con level of confusion that people have. I'd like to do it, but I don't know what to do. That really, that's, that's a huge issue for so many people. I mean, I wrote Big Green Purse to try and allay some of those issues, but there's a lot going out there, going on out there that is just confusing. You have got, got brand loyalty. You really love your company, and you're sort of sitting there saying, you know, should I switch from my company or should I buy this new product? Those kinds of things make it hard sometimes to do the right thing. Share your stories with your friends, your family. Uh, it's something, again, it doesn't cost us anything to talk. We are really good at talking. Women are really good at that. And we, talk, we do it a lot. And you can use text messaging. You can use Facebook. Um, and, you know, when I say that, I don't, I'm not um, trying to play into stereotypes. But it is true. You know, there's a, there was a survey done about how, mon how many words in a day women articulate versus guys. So how many words, on average, would you think a guy says in a day? Come on, I mean. Yeah, the whole day, from, from like dawn until dusk. What do you think it might be? Uh, the research shows that it's about 7,000. 7,000 words, individual words. Well, how many words do you think a woman says? 20. So what are we talking about, ladies? <laughs> we have this incredible, this is a strength. We have an incredible opportunity to communicate what we know, to ask questions about what we don't know, to share information. And I really encourage everybody to do that. Um, you know, there's this old saying that we've got the whole world in our hands. But we don't. We've got it in our purses. So let's use it. How about some questions? OK. That was great. Thank you. If you could uh, give us maybe top three switches that we could make, if you're thinking that might make an environmental difference. You, know, you mentioned water. Um, I don't know, paper towels come to mind. I don't know. But in your book, if you could think about, you know, we go home tonight and there were maybe three things we could think about, what would you recommend? Well, um, you know, energy is really the big issue. Ed energy affects everything. It affects water. It affects air quality. It affects asthma. Uh, it affects the natural environment. I mean, just look at that oil spill that in the Gulf of Mexico. So take a look at how you're using energy at home. And if you haven't switched to compact fluorescent light bulbs in the top five lighting fixtures in your house, you know, the kitchen, the light over the kitchen sink, and the light in the bathroom, the, the light in the overhead light in the bedroom, a couple of those table lamps in the living room, you know, you can get a six pack of light bulbs, compact fluorescents at Home Depot for less than 10 bucks. Those six, if each one saves you $60, six times six, $360 for, t it's a $10 investment for a $360 saving. And it's going to have a great air quality impact. And that's going to affect you locally because power is generated locally. And I will before I go to a, a, a second idea. It turns out that women living in cities where the air is polluted have more heart attacks than men. That's because our hearts are smaller. And where there's a lot of air pollution, our, our hearts have to work harder to keep our lungs working efficiently. So when you're saving energy, you're reducing air pollution. I mean, it has a direct correlation to your health. So. So light bulbs in those top five places. And that's a, you can do it. It won't take you longer than an hour and a half, right? Trip to Home Depot, put in the light bulbs, and then you're done. So that's one. I'm a big um, person on paper. 
Paper towels. I know, they're so convenient, and now you can buy some that are recycled, but there are so many alternatives to paper towels. We are, we are creating so much air pollution and water pollution by making paper. Paper, the manufacturer of paper is the, I think it's the fourth most polluting industry in the entire world. You're cutting down trees, you're pulping them, you're bleaching them, you're moving them. Start, you know, just switch out maybe two rolls of paper towels a week if you're still using them. We've got these great towels up here. These are from Trader Joe's, I think, but there you can get them at a lot of stores, and they work great. It's like a it's sort of almost like a great big long sponge kind of a thing, and you can rinse it out and use it over and over and over again. I mean, I had uh, leftover diapers that I used as rags. I have my kids. I never throw a T-shirt away. I use. I have a bin in my kitchen, and that's what I use. I don't have paper towels, so think about getting rid of the paper towels. And I would say if you're not already buying organic milk, um, I, I, you know, that's, again, that's one of those ones that's going to cost you $3 more a gallon, but I think ultimately it's really worth it, and it's a very simple shift that everybody can make. In the last two weeks, I was looking for rain barrel. Uh-huh. In the last two weeks, we were talking about purchasing rain barrels. And I would suggest that if anyone here is at Home Depot or at the hardware stores, that you just mention whether they carry them. Because we couldn't find a rain barrel at Home Depot. We couldn't find them at the hardware stores. We did find them at the landscape place. Oh, but uh -huh. I think the more it's requested, maybe they'll begin to carry them. There is also a great online retailer called Gardener's Supply. Gardenersupply.com, and they've got all kinds of rain barrels. They've got compost bins, uh, and they'll deliver it right to your door. So that's another option. Yes. These common household items are used throughout the house and cleaning. I, it's actually in my book, and it's on my website, BigGreenPurse.com. But um, you know, you can make a spray. You can use a little bit of liquid soap and a little bit of vinegar and some lemon juice and water, and you make a spray so that it's something a lot of people like to spray for fingerprints and that kind of thing. When I'm doing tile or a kitchen counter, I just sprinkle. I just dampen it, and then I sprinkle baking soda on it. Baking soda is incredible because it's, it's a nice abrasive, but it's very soft. I will say that I think we have become totally paranoid about dirt. And there is a, a billion dollar industry out there that is persuading us to be really scared of dirt. Now, I don't know about you guys growing up, but I grew up, I think, in a pretty normal household. And, you know, my mother cleaned the house on Saturdays. And the rest of the time, we washed our hands before dinner. We were really healthy. And I did that with my kids. You know what? I'm going to tell you a really bad story. And I'm really sorry this is going to be on TV. But. I was one of those kids who, my idea of dessert was like the gum that was stuck in the sidewalk when you're walking down the street. <laughs> Nothing. I mean, I never got sick. I was the healthiest person. I, I'm not advocating that. All I'm saying is that the reason why we're afraid of dirt is because it's in the interest of companies that sell cleaning, cleaning chemicals to make us afraid of dirt. So it's, it's so important for you to use your own common sense and say, wait a minute. I saw, I saw an ad for um, a window cleaning product. And I thought it was very offensive to guys. It showed this guy who had fallen against a window, and he was sort of slobbering. He was sliding down the window. And then the ad said, you know, ladies, come to the rescue and, and, and disinfect the window. And I'm thinking, she kisses the guy, right? She kisses the guy. What does she have to disinfect the window for? And yet, all these cleaning products now contain disinfectants, antibacterials. Well, what's happening? We're building up a resistance to antibiotics, right? So use your common sense. We don't need half the stuff that's being put on us, but we get afraid, and then we buy it. Cosmetics. Um, well, first of all, I would say one of the things I say in Big Green Purse is 
give your body a break. Give your body a break. Can you pick one day where you basically, you know, you wash your face, you brush your teeth, you comb your hair, and then walk away. Slowly back out of the room. You know, just leave, leave, you know, put the makeup bag away. We use so much stuff. And it is true that no one product is going to really make us sick. That's not what it's about. It's about the cumulative effect of all of these chemicals day after day after day. And the fact that all these cosmetics have the same ingredients in them, basically. They're configured a little differently. So when a, when a cosmetic company produces something, is anybody from the cosmetics industry in the room before I put my foot in my mouth here? When, so when they do their testing toxicity tests, they only test their product. So say I'm using a hand lotion, and it's got a paraben in it, which is a preservative. Or say a deodorant, right? Uh, deodorants have a lot of parabens in it. Um, all they're testing is a short application once a day over time. But on average, women use, how many, how many products do you think most women use in a day? In one day, in one day, it's about 23. Now, I mean, stop and think about it. And guys, you're not too far behind. It's gonna be at least 10, maybe 12. You don't think about it. Soap if you wash your face, then lotion, because now you've dried out your face. Unless you've used the toner first because you want to tone the face before you put the lotion on. So you've tightened it so you can soften it, right? No, it's true. Then the bronzer, and then the mineral thing that makes you shine because the bronzer sort of toned you down. So then you put the mineral highlight on. Lipstick or lip liner or lip gloss, eyebrow pencil, eyeliner, mascara, then the eye cream, because we're worried about what's going on down here, and I'm guilty of that sometimes, uh, tanning lotion, or my daughter puts tanning lotion on, I put uh, SPF on because I don't want to get a sunburn. That's just from here up. That's just from here up. Uh, I haven't gotten to the hair yet. Shampoo, conditioner, maybe gel or hairspray, or styling something so that when I come out, I can actually look better than this sometimes. Then keep going down, body lotion. There's hand lotion, there's foot lotion, there's nail polish. Then there's the stuff that hardens the nail polish so that it doesn't chip off. Deodorant, uh, shaving lotion. It's, that's almost every day for a lot of people. So all that stuff built up over time, plus it's got fragrance in it, Everything has fragrance in it. Well, what is fragrance? Fragrance is phthalates. We talked about phthalates before, reproductive toxin. So now we're adding all these phthalates to it. Why do they put phthalates in it? Phthalates are like tiny little atomized missiles. Phthalates actually carry the scent. They're the medium that the scent travels on. So when you spray perfume, you're actually spraying phthalates that contain a little bit of scent. So it's huge. So again, um, and, and actually a lot of the cosmetics companies have gotten them notice about parabens, for example. Parabens, you know, it's funny with things, with certain illnesses and cancer and so on, you can't draw a direct line. It's because they're so, um, it's, it's hard to pin down what causes what. But we do know that parabens are showing up in breast cancer tissue. We don't know what the cause is. We don't know if it just resides there and it's not causal. But that's enough for me. That's enough for me to say, you know, I'm not going to buy deodorant that has a par parabens in it. I'm not going to buy phthalates because if I don't like all those fragrances. And uh, the uh, Food and Drug Administration did a study of acne. What really causes acne? face acne, chest acne. It turns out that the phthalates and fragrances are one of the biggest causes of acne. You're spraying all this stuff, it clogs up your skin, it causes acne. So I look, when I buy cosmetics, I go for stuff that has no phthalates, has no parabens, has no antibacterial agents. I don't know why we need to have all these antibacterial agents and everything. And then any kind of synthetic fragrance. And there is a lot. I mean, um, Trader Joe's has stuff. 
Whole Foods has stuff. Oh, there's a lot online. I list a lot of options in my book. So give your body a break. See if, you know, when you go home, put all the things that you put on your body on the counter. First of all, just do that. And then do a little note on Facebook and say, you're not going to believe what I'm putting on my, you just can't believe it. See if you can take off at least, just get rid of three. Just get rid of three. Do you need the soap and the shower gel and the body wash? Do you, do you need that? Are you that dirty? If you're that dirty, then I, you need something more. You need, <laughs> you need a sandblaster. So take three, you know, give your body a break. Get rid of at least three of the products that you're using. And then use your money. Buy stuff proactively that's going to protect you. What else? Would any of the guys have any questions? You brave souls that showed up tonight? Do you have any well, what's interesting is that there is now a, a, an expanding line of personal care products that are very healthy for guys, which I think is great. Um, I think it's really important for men to get much more involved, even though I joke about my husband in Home Depot. Um, but I think it's got, you know, I hear from a lot of women who say, I'd really love to fill in the blank. I'd love to be um, buying the no VOC paint, but my husband thinks if it doesn't smell, it doesn't work. Or I'd love to be buying the organic milk, but my husband thinks, there's, you know, it's not full milk. And it's really important, I think, for everybody in the household to, tr to see this as something that working together, they c it's better for the family. So definitely, I think uh, everybody has to be equally educated, equally involved, and supportive of decisions to create a better life and a better community. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Diane, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, now. Um, We've got a lot to think about when we go to the store. Debbie will be visiting you. Um, I want to ask people, please, to consider shopping locally. Uh, obviously, we've got difficult economic times. You know, earlier this summer when we walked to the supermarkets, one of the things that I was hoping that people could do, and I recognize that some of us don't live closer to stores, but the less we drive, the less gas we're consuming and the less we're polluting the air. And uh, when I started doing the math, I was doing this for the League of Women Voters on a nationwide basis, it's millions and millions and millions of dollars that we could be saving and shifting. And of course, it's also pollution that's not going into the air. Just want to mention a few stores locally when you're thinking about your holiday uh, shopping. Um, we have some eco-friendly stores. We've got Recology that has, sells recycled goods and Field. Those are both in Larchmont. We have the Mamaronic Artists uh, Guild. Uh, and some of the jewelry that's made there is recycled, but also we'd be supporting our local merchants. Uh, if you're looking for eco-friendly um, cleaning supplies and you're not yet ready to buy the uh, lemon juice, um, talk to me, I'll encourage you. But you can go to um, our two local hardware stores and Stop and Shop and Trader Joe's and A&P also have things on their shelves. One thing I might add, if you can't yet separate yourself from, from paper towels, but hopefully you can, there is um, available paper towels only from recycled paper. So please consider that. And obviously, the bleaching is something that's not so great. Um, we have an abundance of restaurants for the holidays. Um, last night, I went over to the Watercolor Cafe. I heard Carla Bonoff, which was really wow. And I was talking to the owner there, um, Bruce Carroll, who himself is now uh, also um, working with Green Mountain Energy. So for those of us who haven't shifted our electricity, you might thinking about it is, it is gonna cost a little bit more, but, but not on an annual basis to shift over to purchase where there's hydropower and um, wind power. So you can do that there. You can call up Con Edison as well. Um, and uh, let me see if I have any other other thoughts here. There's the yarn store. Maybe, George, you'd like to knit a scarf or something for somebody for the, uh, you know. Um, 
And uh, let's see what else. Well, in any event, um, you know, in terms of what we can do, uh, we do value our local merchants, and it is holiday time. Uh, we've got the bakeries over in Mamaroneck and uh, in Larchmont. So, you know, you, you, you understand, and we're here as a community, and uh, so that's what we ask. For people interested in buying shade-grown coffee, talk to me. I'm happy to be able to provide that for you. And uh, now I think we're going to say goodnight in a minute uh, before I say my goodnights to the people at home. But we'd like to thank LMC TV uh, for airing this to everybody. And I would like to thank uh, Stop and Shop for contributing to the raffle that we're going to have. Um, and again, thank you to Diane McAkern for traveling from Washington, D.C. to be here tonight. And uh, to all at home who joined to watch this, um, if you want to purchase Diane's book, go to www.biggreenpurse.com. And uh, you can place an order. We're glad that you joined us today. Happy holidays. Drive safely. And uh, good night. Thank you.